can confirm that there was a shooting incident this morning at the home of the, the well-known um, Paralympic athlete Oscar Pistorius. At this stage, we can confirm that um, a young woman, a 30-year-old woman, did die on the scene of gunshot wounds. A 26-year-old man has been arrested and has been charged with murder. In the dock, the world's most famous Paralympic athlete, Oscar Pistorius. The victim, his girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp, a model about to hit the big time, the latest star of network television. You fall in love with being in love with love. It's just one love everywhere. But was it, as the state alleges, premeditated murder? Or was it, as Oscar Pistorius claims, an innocent but dreadful mistake? All he said to me was uh, there's been a terrible accident. Uh, Reba's been shot. Uh, I've shot Reba. I'm Rick Edwards and I'm flying 6,000 miles from London to South Africa to find out more about the case that stunned the world. This was by far one of her favourite dresses. For the last two weeks, I've spoken to people close to both Oscar and Reva. She is just the most incredible bubby person. Enough will never ever be enough for him, in the sense that he will always drive himself to achieve better. With computer graphics, we recreate Pistorius's house, and the defence forensic pathologist gives his first TV interview. She was shot in the region of her right hip. She was shot in the right arm, and she was shot in the head. Is there a darker side to the Blade Runner? Yes, he threatened me. Yes, he was aggro, and yes, he was very aggressive on the phone, and yes, he did threaten to break my legs. Now, over the years, I think as more as fame and success and money came into his life, I saw a very different Oscar. Oscar Pistorius spent Valentine's night in a cell in this police station. I've got a copy of his charge sheet here. The accused did unlawfully and intentionally kill Reva Steenkamp. I've come to South Africa to find out how and why this tragic event unfolded. I want to find out what really happened. September, I was at the Olympic Stadium in London presenting coverage of the Paralympics. Millions of viewers across the globe watched as Oscar Pistorius won two gold medals, a silver medal, and set three world records along the way. He was the poster boy for the Paralympics. Later, things have changed so dramatically. The sporting hero is now a murder suspect. Travelling across South Africa, it's hard to understand how a story of modern-day celebrity romance could end in such a way. But it was here, in the pitch-dark early morning of St Valentine's Day, that this secure, quiet suburban estate was woken by shouts, screams and sobs coming from the house of one of South Africa's most famous sons. Oscar Pistorius has shot his new girlfriend, hitting her at least three times. He says it's an accident. He's mistaken her for a burglar. She's still alive. Just. At 3.19, he telephones a neighbour for help. At 3.20, he calls the hospital. He is crying and sobbing. He carries her downstairs to the ground floor, but it's too late. All indications are that she died en route to the bottom where they lay their body downstairs. She died at or about that point. At 3.30, CCTV cameras record the police and ambulance arriving. At 3.55, Oscar Pistorius calls a friend, Justin Devaris, who'd introduced him to Reva. We've approached Justin Devaris several times, and on each occasion, he's declined to take part in our programme. However, we have obtained a recording of the only interview that he has given uh, with a reporter working for the Sunday People. All he said to me was, uh, there's been a terrible accident. Uh, Reba's been shot. Uh, I've shot Reba. And then the neighbour picked up the phone. The neighbour was already in the house, a uh, young lady. And uh, 
She said to me, no, it's true, Lieber has been shot. It's not good. You must, uh, can you come here? He was 40 minutes away in Johannesburg and set off immediately to Pistorius' home near Pretoria. By the time I got there, there was a whole lot of police there. The ambulance had already come and gone. Uh, it was already a crime scene. Uh, I wasn't allowed in the house. The door was open. I could see her lying at the bottom of the stairs, covered in uh, towels. Oscar was being detained in the garage. He was totally incoherent. Um, he just kept saying, uh, I, I, I killed my, my baby. He called her my brother, my baby. Uh, God, take me away. Uh, and he was sobbing the whole time. Good morning, I'm Lynn O'Connor. We continue with our breaking news coverage of a shooting in Pretoria. Olympic and Paralympic star Oscar Pistorius has been taken into custody after he allegedly shot and killed a woman believed to be his girlfriend. At home in Johannesburg, Reva Steenkamp's housemate Gina Myers receives a phone call. I, st I started screaming, where's Reva? Where is she? Where is she? I, I was screaming because I knew and she just said, she said, Gee, I need you to sit down, there's been an accident. And I said, I just carry on saying, where is she? And then I started getting emotional and then she said, Gee, I'm sorry, there's been an accident. And she told me she was gone. I started screaming and my dad came running and my sister was running and my mom came running and I couldn't talk on the phone, I couldn't, I couldn't function. <sighs> I know that I never ever want to relive anything like that again because I would never wish that on my worst enemy. It, it was one of the worst phone calls I've ever received in my whole life. Coverage of this tragic event has swamped the South African media. The level of interest, both national and international, in the events of that night and its aftermath is almost unprecedented. It's arguably the biggest story to come out of South Africa since the release of Nelson Mandela more than 20 years ago. I was completely shocked by what happened. And I think that, that shock began to set in even more throughout the day as, as a fuller picture began to emerge because the initial reports that, that we were hearing that were coming out were about the fact that uh, Oscar Pistorius had shot his girlfriend thinking that she was an intruder. And then the police came out and gave an impromptu press conference outside his home. Um, we have also taken cognizance of the media reports during the course of the morning of an alleged um, break-in or that the, the young lady was allegedly mistaken to be a burglar. Obviously, our forensic investigation is still ongoing. Um, we're not sure where this report came from. It definitely didn't come from the South African Police Service. And all of a sudden, the picture changed. And we began to think, well, maybe that's not the version. Maybe there's more to this. Maybe this isn't a tragedy. Perhaps there was, there was intent. Perhaps there was a, a crime that was committed here. If there was intent, what had happened to cause Oscar Pistorius to shoot dead Reva Steenkamp? A former law student whose photogenic looks were rocketing her to stardom. This year, she was the big new name in a celebrity reality show set in Jamaica. You, you literally fall in love with Jamaica. You fall in love with being in love with love. It's just one love everywhere. But I'm going home with sort of a sweet taste in my mouth. Um, I don't have any regrets, I don't have any bitterness. I take home with me so many amazing memories and things that are in here and that are in here that I'll treasure forever. But I think the way that you go out, not just your journey in life, but the way that you go out and you make your exit is so important. It's, you either made an impact in a positive way or a negative way. But just maintain integrity and maintain class and just always be true to yourself. And I'm going to miss you all so much. I love you very, very much. She was just the most incredible, bubbly person. Um, you could feel as soon as she walked into a room, as soon as, as soon as she walked into anywhere, you could you could feel her presence. Um, she just had this way about her. I, I promise you, if if you had met her, you'd just say hello to her, and she had this smile. But she had these, this beautiful, beautiful smile, and her eyes always lit up. She was very smart, and she had this way with words to. Every single time I was upset or I cried, I'd land up laughing. It was just her way of 
making me happy and making people happy in general. Your immediate thoughts when you see someone that beautiful is it's impossible to have someone so magnificent on the inside as she is on the outside. But she really was. Get back to here. Yeah. Reva lived as part of the family with her best friend Gina Myers. The two girls were inseparable and were in constant contact. <laughs> Through the years, it was every single night I'd get a message from her saying, Night, my G, I love you. Every single night. I didn't meet anyone who had a bad word to say about Reva. Warren LaHood went out with her for five years and they remained close. She was really loving, she was giving. And that's, that's what I'm going to really miss. I mean, I can't pick up the phone and, and say hello and, and hear that warm voice of hers. And, you know, that's, that's, that's the hardest part of this whole thing. Local celebrity tattooist Pepe Demevski also knew her from her early days in Johannesburg. I met Riva in, in my shop about actually maybe close to five years ago. So how many tattoos of hers did you do? I did two, two of her tattoos. The first one, it was a kind of long sentence, something like a poem on her back. The second one was um, writing on her ankle, says Linus. She was a great person. So, I mean, woman with uh, such a big character and personality and charisma. She was an amazing person. I mean, slowly, slowly, she became kind of famous in the uh, in, uh, in, uh, model uh, fashion industry. And yeah, she was, she was exactly the same person. How I say, she was down to earth. Down to earth, but in South African celebrity circles, Riva Steenkamp was on the rise. She started to receive invites to Johannesburg's round of promotional launches and award ceremonies. For the paparazzi, blonde model Reva Stinkup was a natural target. 2012 was her breakthrough year, when she started to get noticed. She was on the cover of FHM, and soon she was on the radar of top-selling celebrity magazine, Heat. I should go through a few of the pictures. She was always on the social scene. These are also some great exclusive photos of her playing with um, some puppies at Puppy Haven, um, a, a charity here in South Africa. And this was at her birthday, her birthday party in August last year. With Reva, last year her name kept on popping up and she kept on popping up at events and on the red carpet. And then this reality show happened and then with the Oscar relationship with him being um, one of the biggest stars in South Africa, that was when we decided, OK, you know, this girl is definitely, she's here now. She's beautiful. She's really lovely. She's a pleasure to work with. She's dating one of the biggest stars in the world. And that was, that was kind of the moment where we decided, right, it's time to go with her and to follow her career. Oscar and Reva, a huge and lucrative new media brand was emerging and Heat magazine wanted to own it. Yeah, that's her and Oscar. This is quite a rare picture from a, um, from a friend's engagement party. Reporter Sonia Rath was assigned to stick close to Reva. She was a breath of fresh air. She really was beautiful, as beautiful on the outside as she was inside. She would always make time for you, no matter what it was. Um, she, she just, I keep saying, she had such a beautiful soul. But Oscar and Reva had only started dating in November 2012. It was still early days. They wanted to keep the relationship private for as long as possible and not do media for as long as possible um, because they didn't want the media to taint the relationship. Obviously, the relationship was only a few months old and that was one of the biggest factors as to why they didn't really want to come out with it as of yet because it was still new. And um, she really didn't want anything to taint that. Because we were pursuing them for this cover story and, and they had agreed, we still needed to get a date secured with them for the shoot. To confirm the details of the photo shoot, the Heat team found a date which they could see both Oscar and Reva on, February the 7th. As it turns out, seven days before Reva was killed. The Sports Awards. This is one of the rare occasions where she, she walked the red carpet with Oscar. I was adamant that that journalist had to go um, because they were going to be there and to chat with them and to get more from them, to chat to them about the relationship and to secure a date for the photo shoot. And that's practically why we were there and why we interviewed them 
She was very happy. She made a huge emphasis on how much she did adore him and admired him and in what high esteem she holds him. It was really lovely to see them together and I think a beautiful model on the rise with one of our biggest sporting stars had great potential um, to be one of the golden couples in SA. I think uh, once that they came out with their relationship, which would have been in our exclusive cover with them, it really would have escalated. They would have gotten a lot more attention and it really would have been huge. London 2012, the crowning glory of Oscar Pistorius. He makes history by becoming the first double leg amputee to compete in the Olympics before going on to become one of the stars of the Paralympics. It was the climax of a remarkable story, the gold medal runner born without fully formed legs, both amputated below the knee when he was just 11 months old. When they were youngsters growing up, his mom always used to say to him and to his brother, your brother Carl puts his shoes on and you put your legs on. There's no difference between the two of you. Get out there and do it. And I think that the way his life started out was what drove him to where he is today, that he was able to just keep pushing himself and realize whatever an able-bodied person could do, I could do as well. He allowed a BBC crew inside his house in the Silverwoods estate in 2009 and recalled his greatest influence, his devoted and determined mother, who never lived to see his success. My mother was a so huge influence on my life. You know, she. She never really told us what to do, but she gave us great guidelines. And, and uh, you know, I really think in the situations that I've had um, since her passing, you know, I've really the, the lessons that she taught me have really helped me to to deal with those things. And about three weeks, four weeks before she passed away, she wrote me a letter, and in the letter she said, "Look after those legs that run so fast. Uh, train, don't strain." You know, and it was kind of like, you know, she I wasn't even involved with athletics at the time, but I think she was a very wise, wise woman, and. Uh, you know, the lessons that she taught me definitely have helped me, you know, I think, and, 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 and definitely inspired me in the last couple of years being an athlete. Fast and getting faster. Meet Oscar Pistorius. On the track, they call him Blade Runner. Oscar Pistorius was 17 with spots and braces when he won gold at the 2004 Paralympics in Athens. He used prosthetic blades called cheetahs, which gave him the nickname the Blade Runner. Remarkably, he'd only started athletics training eight months before the Games, a regime that demanded the highest levels of grit and determination. I train harder than any of the other guys do. Um, I put in more hours, I eat better, I sleep better, I rest better, and overall I think I'm a, I'm a more diligent, I train better than the other guys. Now, Oscar, welcome. Are you going to be the man to make history and compete in the Olympics? He quickly became a favourite in television studios, friendly, polite, on his way to being an international sporting hero. He's one of the real nice guys of the sport. Going to be hurting a little bit losing that 100, but he demonstrates just how good he is and why he comes here with such a big reputation. But for Oscar Pistorius, it wasn't just about the Paralympics. He took on the world's top athletics authorities in a battle to compete against able-bodied athletes, and he won. I think I've always been very confident um, in, in my ability as an athlete and in, in, in the, the kind of faith that my coach has had in me. So although there have been seasons where I've missed my targets and haven't made them, I've stayed dedicated and I haven't had any space for doubt in my mind. He became a sponsorship magnet, a global multi-million dollar icon. And what about sponsors? Have you got a lot of sponsors? Yeah, I've got some really good sponsors, you know, and they've been looking after me. I think most of the sponsors I'm with to date, I've been with for a very long time, like Nike and Oakley and a company, IT company called Cispro. Um, and there's a South African bank called Nedbank. And then, uh, you know, my, my biggest sponsor and the ones that look after me are Pirelli. You know, I've really been, uh, the, all the time we spend in Italy and when I'm based there in, in, in most of the months in, in the European summer, um, they're really the company that really, you know, helps me out with a lot of the things that I do there. And do you think, do you think the marketability of Paralympic athletes is a lot lower than Olympic athletes, as a rule? I think, it, I think it has been in the past, but I think it's definitely stepping up. Arriving at Oscar Pistorius' estate at 6pm on February the 13th, these are the last pictures of Riva Steenkamp alive, captured on security CCTV 
seemingly happy, smiling, and bringing with her the photo she had selected as his Valentine's present. Oscar Pistorius was filmed arriving ten minutes afterwards. Later that night, Reva tweeted. What do you have up your sleeve for your love tomorrow? We've spoken to people who shared Reva's last 48 hours. The morning before, she'd been with her best friend, Gina Myers. She was here. I was getting ready. I was actually, I think I was doing my hair. And she was getting ready for a meeting and I was getting ready to go to work. Um, and as when she left, she told me I was going to be awesome and that she loved me. And then I ran out and then I gave her a hug and then she left. Later that day, Reva met up with her ex-boyfriend, Warren LaHood. I saw Reva on the Tuesday, the 12th of, of February. Um, she contacted me and we met up for a quick coffee and uh, that was it. And she seemed fine. Oscar Pistorius telephoned Reva twice during their catch-up. I said, is everything OK? I mean, he's phoned twice already every 20 minutes. Um, I asked her that question. She said, there's nothing wrong. Um, she always told me that she, she wouldn't be with anybody that she felt unhappy with or um, she wouldn't allow herself to be with somebody like that. Gina Myers was in contact with Reva throughout the Tuesday and the Wednesday, February the 13th. We generally chatted throughout the day. We had chatted in the morning and we had chatted during the afternoon. And even though I saw her um, in the morning and the evening, Every day, it was, we still um, spoke throughout the day. Phone calls, texts. That evening, Reva texted home to say it was too late to drive back from Pretoria and she was going to stay over with Oscar. My mum and dad don't really sleep unless they know that we're safe or where we are. Um, so it's just a general rule. If you're going to sleep out or if you, you know, wherever you are, just let us know. That was actually the first night in a while, we hadn't said goodnight, I love you. Oscar Pistorius says that in the early hours of Valentine's Day, he and Reva were asleep in his bedroom. Using plans of the property, we've recreated the scene in daylight to give you an idea of the layout of the bedroom and ensuite bathroom. Pistorius says it's crucial to remember that it was the middle of the night and dark. In his version of events, he was unusually on the left-hand side of the bed, as we look at it here, because he had a shoulder problem. He and Reva had swapped sides. We've used the words of his sworn testimony. I woke up, went onto the balcony to bring the fan in and close the sliding doors, the blinds and the curtains. I heard a noise in the bathroom and realised that someone was in the bathroom. Too scared to switch on the lights, he says he didn't put on his prosthetic legs, but walked on his stumps towards the noise. I grabbed my 9mm pistol from underneath my bed. On my way to the bathroom, I screamed the words to the effect for him or them to get out of my house and for Reva to phone the police. It was pitch dark in the bedroom and I thought Reva was in bed. From the bathroom doorway, he says he sees an open window. He again hears noises. They're coming from behind the closed door of the separate toilet. He opens fire with his 9mm pistol. I fired shots at the toilet door and shouted to Reva to phone the police. She did not respond, and I moved backwards out of the bathroom, keeping my eyes on the bathroom entrance. Everything was pitch dark in the bedroom, and I was still too scared to switch on a light. Reva was not responding. When I reached the bed, I realised that Reva was not in bed. That is when it dawned on me that it could have been her who was in the toilet. I returned to the bathroom, calling her name. I tried to open the toilet door, but it was locked. I rushed back into the bedroom and opened the sliding door, exiting onto the balcony, and screamed for help. Only at this point, he says, does he turn on the light and put his prosthetic legs on before returning to the bathroom to break down the toilet door with his cricket bat. A prominent specialist forensic pathologist, Reggie Peramal, was flown in by Oscar Pistorius' defence team to examine all the crime scene evidence and attend the autopsy. She was shot in the region of her right hip. She was shot in the right arm. And she was shot in the head. There was also a shot on one of the fingers of the left hand. So whether there are three shots or four shots, 
it won't be easy to say at this stage. He was, however, able to confirm one aspect of the defence case. She appeared to have gone to the toilet. Most individuals would have had some urine in the bladder at 3 a.m. in the morning. In this case, the bladder was completely empty. We couldn't even get a mill or two for uh, toxicology. That says that in all probability, she voluntarily uh, emptied the bladder because there was no evidence of urine on the scene itself. During the four-day bail hearing, the prosecution presented a very different version of events that night. Prosecution witnesses claims there were shouting and screaming coming from the house. The questions are who was shouting and screaming and at what time. One witness states that she heard non-stop fighting between 2 and 3 a.m. and then she heard gunshots. Another witness heard shots, saw lights on and then 17 minutes later heard further gunshots. We've also been told that near neighbours only 50 metres away heard female screams followed by gunshots, followed by more screams. Pistorius' housekeeper who lives behind the house didn't hear any screams, apparently because there's a water feature close by which would have drowned out any other noise. The prosecution says Oscar Pistorius got up from the bed, strapped on his prosthetic legs, armed himself and purposefully walked the seven metres to the bathroom where Reaver had locked herself in the toilet. She had apparently taken her mobile phone with her. The prosecution further alleged Pistorius wanted to kill. In the prosecutor's words, there's a big argument and you crack, you take out a gun and you fire. The police investigator called by the prosecution claims Oscar Pistorius was right inside the bathroom with his back to the basins when he started firing. Crucially, he says, he was shooting 1.5 metres from the toilet door. The four bullets had a downwards trajectory from a normal stance. So, he claims, he must have had his prosthetic legs on. I have been to the scene, but unfortunately, one very important aspect of the scene was not there. It was taken away. That is the door. The door is important to us, and we really need to get access to it soonest, because the trajectory of the projectiles through the door will give us a very good idea where the shortest was standing. All this will be tied up with the trajectory on the body of the deceased, together with one um, bullet or projectile mark on one of the walls. Despite the prosecution's reliance in court on Oscar Pistorius wearing his prosthetic legs, we've been told the new investigating team wants to downplay this claim. They don't think they'll be able to prove it and think it should never have been mentioned by the prosecution. The prosecution's main witness was the police investigator, Warrant Officer Bota. Much of his testimony was successfully challenged by the defence. First, he said that quarrelling had been heard by a witness who was 600 yards away. When people in the court laughed at that, he said that it may have been 300 yards. The witness didn't know whose voices she'd heard, and another witness got the number of shots wrong. His assertions about the bullet's trajectory were not backed up by forensic or ballistic evidence. Boater also admitted that he'd not worn protective shoes at the crime scene. Boater was taken off the case after it was discovered that he too faces criminal charges relating to another shooting. He's now quit the force. We've been told by a senior source that at the police station, while Oscar Pistorius was being interviewed and charged, officers told him that he could be facing a very long time in jail. Pistorius is said to have replied, I'll survive, I always win. I come to the conclusion that the accused has made a case to be released on bail. Yes! The Pistorius family have told us that they categorically deny he said those words to the police. He did get bail, the judge praising his detailed account, on condition that he doesn't return home or leave Pretoria. He's been banned from drinking and has had to pay a £75,000 bond. But the judge did raise five key questions. He's in the middle. Why did the accused not ascertain the whereabouts of his girlfriend as he got out of bed? Why did the accused not seek to verify exactly who was in the toilet? 
Why did Reva not scream back from the toilet? Why would you not escape through the bedroom door rather than venture further into danger? And the judge also questioned the explanation for why the couple had swapped sides of the bed that night. I had a job last year. Um, it was two hours away from here, and she didn't want me to drive by myself. So she came with me and she decided we were going to make a road trip out of it. So she drove with me there and back and she made this little picture frame and, and yeah, just capturing our road trip memory. That was fun. Uh, this is her room? Yeah, this is her room. It, it smells so beautiful, the smell's gone, her smell is gone. We used to come in here and just feel like you were in like a little cave um, with her and it smelt beautiful and her little lamp was always on, the bright lights were never on, it was just, it was very warm, it was, it was very Reva, she made it very homey, like just being in here, this is probably the longest time I spend in here, it's very hard for me, I, I'll, I'll come in here and I'll sit here for two minutes and then I leave. Um, this was by far one of her favourite dresses. Yeah, she wore it to one or two functions, um, but I know she bought it off a shoot because she, was, she loved it so much. Um, I think she did the shoot in Cape Town. But wow, and, and I remember the first night I saw her wear it, I was at the same function, and, and she came, her hair was like in curls, like blonde, beautiful, it was, she looked amazing. We have to eventually pack them up and send them to her parents. Um, at the moment, I can't. Every time it sets in, my heart breaks because I realise she's not coming back. And I realise that there's a whole nightmare I'm not going to wake up from. The wealthy circle in South Africa can be tight-knit, but today it's divided over the innocence or guilt of Oscar Pistorius. Lining up in his defence are people who've known him all of his life. Mike Azzi, a friend of Oscar Pistorius' parents, has watched him grow up and has trained racehorses for him. The first horse we selected for him was Watchful, and she won him five races. All his horses he's owned have won for him, and he has a Group 1 winner as well to boot, so he's a pretty, pretty lucky boy. For Mike Azzi, there was always something special about the kid who battled against the odds. I watched him as a kid in Form 2 playing rugby with the able-bodied guys in the school. And on the one day, they tackled him out of his prosthesis. And he jumped up and he said to the guy, look what you've done to me, look what you've done, you've broken my leg right off. And the guy got such a fright. And then Oscar patted him on the back and said, don't worry, mate. And he clipped his leg back on and carried on to the game. And I always thought, this is a special kid. Adam Azzi, Mike's son, was at school with Oscar Pistorius and also testifies to his character. Everything that's happened recently, it's hard to believe because it's a side of Oscar that I never really saw. I've always known him as a really compassionate and uh, very affectionate person. Um, he was always the one guy that wanted to give you a hug, give you a kiss, what's up. Uh, you know, he just was a close friend to everyone. Did he ever talk to you about Reva? I knew he'd been dating a girl that he was smitten over. But Reva in herself is an amazing young girl. She's a beautiful girl. Her, f her family, I know the father, and they are amazing people. And just a tragedy about this poor girl because she was an amazing person. How did you find out about what happened? Um, I was unfortunate enough to hear from my wife. I was coming off the track in the morning and she was... She phoned me and she was beside herself and she was crying and said to me that... Um, Oscar had, um, had a terrible accident and um, his girlfriend was involved in a shooting. And then when did you find out more details? Um, I went onto the news straight away and I kept following it and tried to get hold of Carl and the family and they didn't take calls. So we've been battling. Obviously, I can understand where they're coming from. This kid must be besides himself. Front cover of Time magazine. Wow, 
just very powerful. Oscar Pistorius, the headline, Man, Superman, Gunman. Oscar Pistorius and South Africa's culture of violence. The shock is felt everywhere. Sports journalist Graham Joffe has known Pistorius man and boy, but believes that along the way, something's changed. Incredible journey when I think uh, I met him for the first time probably 10 years ago. It was uh, soon after his mother passed away. I just met this incredible, humble kid who had the world at his feet, uh, amazing kid, just uh, the drive, the positiveness. I was just, I was, I was in awe of him. And I thought, what an incredible person. A kid that's got this disability, um, doesn't let it get him down. It was the real Oscar. And then sadly, over the years, I think as more as fame and success and money came into his life, I saw a very different Oscar. A very different Oscar, surrounded by the trappings of celebrity. The racehorses, the high-performance motors, even two white tigers and the guns. He was building up a collection and had applied to license six specialist firearms. There's no shortage of people who will tell you what a fantastic and inspirational individual Oscar Pistorius is, a truly global icon. But as I travel around South Africa, there are some who question his well-crafted media image. A darker side of the man is starting to emerge. First, the stories of recklessness. Aged 19, he nearly killed himself in a car crash, driving 400 miles through the night to settle what he describes was a blistering row with an ex-girlfriend. He fell asleep at the wheel. He's admitted that he was unforgivably stupid. In February 2009, aged 23, more recklessness. He crashed his speedboat into a submerged pier, smashed his face to bits and was airlifted to hospital. Weeks later, in his BBC Inside Sport interview, he detailed his extensive injuries. And actually, in this picture, is probably the best one to describe. It's, you can hear, out of all these CAT scans and MRIs and stuff, you can actually see where the doctors have highlighted several here, and they've got to where I broke my cheekbone here, and I broke the floor bone of my eye, and um, here I broke part of my nose. There I broke the bridge off my nose. Uh, I had uh, wide my jaw, I had my jaw wide on, that came off last week, and since then I've been eating steak literally every single day. Next, stories of aggressive behaviour. In September 2009, Pistorius was arrested at a neighbour's party, held in custody and charged with assaulting a girl who had a door slammed in her face. In the end, no action was taken. And I told her to get off the property and I was actually on the way to the police station to just open a report and they'd already arrived at my house so it was a, it was a bit of a, a mass confusion and uh, it ended up just turning completely sour and um, you know the next morning I mean I had to spend the night in jail which I never ever thought I would have to do. But the word was on the street that Oscar Pistorius was attracting trouble. Riva's tattooist Pepe Demevski had heard the rumours. Everyone here bad stories about him, not such a good stories. The people I like, I bump to or hear from. Um, even a friend of mine, Mark Bachelor, the football player, had issues with him. They speak on the phone and Oscar threatened him that he's gonna break his legs. I mean, that's that's actually ridiculous. Could that be true? Did Oscar Pistorius really say he would break someone's legs? The man he's supposed to have made the phone call to is Mark Batchelor, an ex-professional footballer. He agreed to see me and confirmed that last November there'd been a row over one of Oscar's ex-girlfriends. You mentioned your run-in with Oscar. Can you, can you talk me through exactly what happened? Yeah, my phone rang and it's Oscar. What's your effing problem with me, boy? So I told him I'm not your boy and I, we had a few words and he started threatening me and telling me how he's going to F me up and break my legs and I was basically laughing because, and this is not being disrespectful to rude to anybody, but I mean, Oscar, he doesn't have any legs. What, are, you know, what, what is he going to do? I'm double his size, uh, I do a bit of boxing, I'm not, you know, I'm not scared to take on anybody, but I'll never ever do that. I can't, if I had to do something to Oscar, what am I? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bully and I'm, so I, I actually like laughed it off. Then Oscar Pistorius went to the police to say that it was him who'd been threatened by Mark Batchelor. The police interviewed both men, but decided the matter should be dropped. The same day I met him, Mark Batchelor was interviewed by police. He says that several other prominent wealthy South Africans are also helping police with their inquiries into the Pistorius case.
In January this year, weeks before Riva Steenkamp was shot dead, there was a gunshot incident involving Pistorius at a restaurant in Johannesburg. A firearm went off under a table, narrowly missing someone's foot. A friend took the blame. There have been new rumours and hearsay about aspects of this case coming out almost every day. Most of them have not been borne out by the evidence that's been made public so far. Reva Steenkamp did not sustain injuries by being beaten with a cricket bat. She was not pregnant. Contrary to what the police first said, there was no testosterone found in the house and only one gun was found in the house, a 9mm pistol. Right, week three, here we go in Super 15, Friday, 8.30, Blues against Crusaders. Yeah, I, absolutely the biggest game of the weekend, you know. I, but I, while there are rumours, there are genuine concerns, even among those who count themselves as close to Oscar Pistorius. There were signs in the last five years, there were incidents that have happened, that things that felt like the bubble was about to burst. Who was making these things disappear? For, yeah, it's a good question. You know, uh, you know the allegations of how some of these cases did disappear. You know, they disappeared very quickly, whether it be the media, whether it be on the management side, because no sponsor wants to be involved with somebody who's got something, you know, this kind of, what, allegations against him of some kind of, whether it be verbal or physical abuse. So at the end of the day, these things did disappear very quickly. Now, as I said, no one wanted to dig deeper into Oscar Pistorius. How tough, you know, as I said before, how tough it's been for him with a disability to be able to fight for the right to run with able-bodied athletes. His whole life has been a fight. When Oscar Pistorius spoke out at the Paralympics criticising a rival who'd beaten him when wearing longer prosthetics, Graham Joffe felt the athlete had gone too far. The incidents in the Paralympics for me was the last straw. I really believe that outburst was after so much was bubbling under. And I just felt that it was a case of sour grapes. It, it just, for me, it didn't come across like the real Oscar, the way that he behaved when he lost at the Paralympic Games. Just because there were one or two stories in the past about Oscar that weren't positive, doesn't mean he, he, there's something brewing, you know, behind the scenes. Maybe there is, but we don't know that. The fact that somebody, you know, dropped an assault charge, or, or that he was, you know, crashed the boat because he was drunk. Like, none of that is proof that, that he, this man was capable of, of, of shooting somebody and killing them purposefully. Um, I just, I would hate, I would hate to make a, a judgment like that. And I think people are, everybody's trying to dig now and they're trying to see, were there signs, were there signs? I don't think it's fair to do that. Adam Azzi, who's known Pistorius since their school days, believes that for a top-flight athlete, his behaviour is normal. There have been reports in the press previously about a kind of um, darker side to Oscar. What did you make of that? Um, I wouldn't say a darker side. Um, I think if people want to say it's an aggressive side, I would say every young man's got an aggressive side to him, no more than you or me. Um, I didn't ever see it as a bad side. I always thought that his aggression was what fueled his uh, success to be as competitive as he was as an athlete. Oscar Pistorius' defence rests on fear. Fear he says he had for his own safety in Reavers. Rates of violent crime and murder are high in South Africa. Like Oscar Pistorius, millions protect themselves with guns. South Africans, are, no matter where they live, no matter what their, uh, uh, um, their background, um, have been subjected to an onslaught of crime for, uh, for many years. And, uh, as a result of which they've taken the, the, the need to defend themselves as seriously as they possibly can, given the limitations. Even in a high security estate, uh, you may not be entirely secure. Uh, some people might feel the need to, to, uh, to sleep with, a, as you put it, a gun under their beds. Reva Steenkamp also knew how to handle a gun. After one session, she posted on Instagram. Shooting games this morning. I feel they're stressed now. The reality of South Africa is that, is that we are a society which has a disproportionately uh, high rate of crime against, against civilians. 
And um, yeah, you, you can you can either be a, uh, you can either live in that society and, and take whatever precautions are that you possibly can to prevent it happening to you, um, or or live in fear. It's a reality of, of life in South Africa. We are where we are. Across South Africa, people have fled open residential areas for the sort of gated, high-security estates where Oscar Pistorius lived. So we're just driving around the outside of the Silverwoods compound now. And the most striking thing from here, anyway, is the, the height of the perimeter walls and the electrified wire that runs along the top of them. Can't really see anyone getting in there. There's also security guards sort of dotted around the edge. That seems to be true of all of the neighbouring compounds as well. Silverwoods has a reputation of being as secure as it comes, complete with dogs, patrol cars, a biometric identification entry system and a fully wired anti-intruder wall. As you can see, we've got a standard electric fence uh, according to South African rules and laws that you can do. It's maximum voltage. It's got earth loops to prevent anybody tampering with it. It's got an alarm on it. Um, and then we've got the beams to protect the fence as well. You put your finger on here and it reads your fingerprint and only the fingerprints loaded onto the system will allow residents to gain access to the estate. It's recording the number plates, recording your face and there's um, some other cameras around recording movement of people coming in and out of the estate. In the last three years we had four incidents of which the last one was October 2011, November 2011. Uh, and since then, we put measures in place to try and mitigate that risk. Protected by the fortress-like security, this was Oscar Pistorius in happier times at home. But there are many stories about his readiness to draw a gun here. He tweeted last November... Nothing like getting home to hear the washing machine on and thinking it's an intruder to go into full combat recon mode into the pantry. He told one interviewer he felt most vulnerable when in bed without his prosthetics on. Dexter Razzi, who's known Pistorius from school, stayed at the house one night and saw how twitchy he was about security. It was quite a hard evening, so I woke up to put a fan on, and after bumping it over, it made quite a loud bang. So I think within a minute he ran outside and he, had, he, he didn't have his prosthetic legs on, he was on his stumps, and he had his 9 wheel in his hand and he asked if everything was all right. And I responded yes, and then he went back into his room. In this country, a lot of people do sleep with their guns under their pillows or beside their beds. So I didn't picture it as irregular in the sense of in South African context. So that's why I didn't really question him about it. Reva Steenkamp was herself once a law student. So as South Africa prepares for its biggest criminal trial in years, I went to find out what law students at Pretoria University make of the case. For them, violence in society is a central issue. Do any of you live or have relatives or whatever who live in these kind of uh, highly secure estates? Because that's kind of the norm, isn't it? Now? That's pretty normal, actually. Everyone has to have real high levels of security. Everyone, almost everyone has alarm, electric fence, Beams Bob's outside. Wire. When I'm home alone, I walk around with a panic button in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm just saying, it's this, bad. This lady was shaking her head about the idea that you have to. Like, why so extreme? It's bad because no. if you hear the stories that are just all around you, it doesn't even make the news anymore. Because just like our neighbor, no. our neighbor got shot and raped. Like she got killed with a screwdriver. What three, you know, five years ago? I think the government of South Africa hasn't done hasn't done enough to try to curb the crime. It's there, but. They're not doing that much because if you start listening to such gruesome crimes that have been happening, just barely a week, as she said, barely a week, a girl was raped, another one was decapitated, and her family was raped and killed. And that is just nothing. You do get scared, you do panic. Hearing all these stories happening in all these areas, you do think it could also happen to me at any time, any place. You have to, be, you have to um, be safe. You have to try and keep yourself safe. If a criminal wants to break into your house, I don't care how much security you have there, they will make a plan to get in. I imagine that you feel there's, a, there's an onus on yourselves to 
protect you. You look after yourself. Um, with that in mind, would any of you carry guns on your person? I would. Yes. <laughs> I would. <laughs> I would. The stories that you hear of people getting shot by their own gun. And I think, I think if you, like, so now how scared I am, if I now know, okay, I have a gun in my handbag, cool, I can do anything, then you immediately subject yourself to more danger. Um, so what have you all made of the Pistorius case? I was shocked and immediately a bit disappointed because he's a national hero and I think a lot of the South Africans share my opinion and felt the same emotion. I couldn't believe um, how South Africans were quick to jump and believe that he was guilty without um, there having been any evidence proved at all. Um, it's unlawful, intentionally killing of another human being and a human being died. Was it unlawful? Was it self-defense? He'll have a hard time proving self-defense. Um, intentionally, it was four shots were fired. His story and his affidavit, it just didn't check out for me. There was just too many loopholes. He went into the bedroom too many times and yet he still didn't notice that she was not in bed. I think it also puts pressure on the, gov on the government and the state. I think that's where they're also getting it wrong. They rushed the case. To me, they rushed the case. If I was, based on an objective view, if that was the actual case, Pristorius would have walked. Because of his achievements, people automatically kind of assume, okay, Oscar Pistorius is a hero, you know, look what he overcame, he doesn't have legs, and see what he's doing now, but that doesn't make him a good person. His case is not only a shock for us, but it's drawing international media attention for us as well. So the case needs to be handled properly because now our criminal justice system is in the spotlight. Apart from looking whether he is guilty or not, a stigma will always hang around him. You know, Even if he gets free now, he will walk past people and people will like, hey, you're the guy that shot your girlfriend. You know, or people, when he goes to jail, people will sympathize with him and be like, no, Oscar would have never done that. So whatever happens to him, the rest, the rest of his life is screwed, basically. This is Waterkloof, an upmarket suburb of Pretoria. As a condition of his bail, Oscar Pistorius is staying in this house, his Uncle Arnold's house, at least until the start of his trial, which is at the beginning of June. I'm going to see if I can get an answer on the buzzer, if I'm allowed to. Can I just... Please, can I... please, please. The guards have obviously been briefed not to let anyone approach the house or, or try and get in or speak to anyone, and I think it's best not to push them any further. In South Africa, media coverage of the case has been unrestrained. There will be no jury at Oscar Pistorius' murder trial. A judge alone will pass verdict. The bail hearing has forced the athlete to give his version of events, which is sworn testimony and will therefore be difficult to change if new evidence is presented. As Oscar Pistorius' image is dismantled worldwide and his sponsorships cancelled, he's being forced to sell everything to build up a war chest for the battles ahead. He's selling off all his properties and everything because obviously the legal costs are going to run into millions of rands. So he's trying to make sure that he has cash available so that he can um, be able to sort out his attorneys and pay for his illegal fees. The man Oscar Pistorius calls Uncle Mike has taken on the sad task of selling off the racehorses. He's been talking to Oscar a lot in recent days. He has no confidence in his tone of voice. Um, he's just a man that, almost like someone that's walking around in circles and doesn't know where he's going. He just always seems to mention Reva and to ask us to pray for her and her family. But most of all, I said to him, he's got to understand that we are here for him and we will always be his friends. I would say, just speaking to him, that he's a broken man and I would go as far as to say that he would be on the verge of suicide. It really worries me. His family deny that he is suicidal. I've returned to London to finish this film, but information continues to reach us from the top of the investigation. Police tell us that they're looking at a massive number of texts on Reva's iPhone. They've also requested all records of phone calls and messages sent and received by Oscar and Reva that night. Police also tell us that they will not enter into a plea bargain for any lesser charge, which strongly suggests that they will continue to pursue the charge of premeditated murder, which means that Oscar Pistorius, if found guilty, could face life. A straightforward charge of murder would carry 15 years. The team defending the Paralympic champion still insists that it was a tragic accident and that the true story will all be revealed during the court case. They also say that Oscar is distraught. Reva Steenkamp's family want her to be remembered as the bright, beautiful daughter 
that was the star of a new reality TV show. They authorised the broadcast tribute to Reva, which seems like a fitting way to end this documentary. I think the way that you go out, not just your journey in life, but the way that you go out and you make your exit is so important. It's, you either made an impact in a positive way or a negative way. But just maintain integrity and maintain class and just always be true to yourself. And I want her to be remembered for the heart that she had and for the way she believed in love and life. I want people to just remember her and and just embrace what she was about and what she wanted to live for. And I'm gonna miss you all so much. And I love you very, very much.